work in other countries, with people from other countries, representing my own country, and many days I feel like an ambassador when I do that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but then I actually went and looked up what an ambassador really is, and I realized that in the U.S., we recognize 197 countries in the world, and we send out 146 ambassadors into the world. This is roughly what our ambassadorial tour looks like. It's about 70% male, 30% female. It's about 80% white, 10% African American, 5% Latino, 5 Asian. Our ambassador to Albania on the bottom row is half Japanese, half Mexican, so I covered that statistic. <laughs> 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 I make about $150,000 a year, except this year, ambassador to Ireland on the top right, who's also chairman of the Pittsburgh Steelers, so he probably brings home a bit more than that as well. So I thought, well, I don't really belong in that group of people. Um, but then I thought, wait a minute, ambassadors are supposed to be representatives of one country to others. The average American makes $40,000 a year. We're cut 50-50 male and female, and we're much more racially diverse than this group. So I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I am an ambassador. Maybe there's a better definition of what that could be. Uh, and I thought to people like my friend Denai, who was a student at UChicago, was very interested in public health as well, especially in malaria. Traveled to rural Tanzania and did a brilliant project with the hospital there. Ended up improving their hospital system, doing a thesis on malaria, a win-win, and that seems pretty ambassadorial to me. Um, or my friend Jakob, who loves playing soccer, plays it all around the world, and realized in Sierra Leone that it was really effective as a means of healing from trauma from kids who were involved with the war, and started an organization around that. And I think that's pretty ambassadorial too. And then my friend Jenny in the back there, who's a UNC alum and a Morgan Cain scholar, uh, travels all around the world, and she's in Cambodia now, and she just launched Cambodia's first ever fashion week with her interest in style and the arts, uh, which is great for her colleagues there in the country because it's normally portrayed as a country of genocide and pain and hurt, and she's showing a new modern art uh, front to that. So it seems very ambassadorial. And we had some other speakers today, the poets, um, Portraits of a Revolution are certainly in this category as well. We have Shamila coming up later, who also I think is in this category. Um, and I was thinking my own kind of trajectory and my journey in public service. I <coughs> studied abroad in Ghana and was working with students doing an AIDS curriculum and traveling across West Africa to get to Timbuktu on a journey and hanging out with teenagers in Tanzania doing an HIV testing program, um, working with community organizers in South Africa, chatting about religion with a monk in Thailand, discussing girls' education with uh, the janitor of a school in rural Kenya, uh, doing karaoke with some Indonesian nurses on World Aids Day, uh, doing a, a traveling ceremony with some friends in rural Laos, and talking about religion in a, park, a church parking lot in Ethiopia. All completely insignificant in the scheme of politics and, and global affairs, uh, but seems to me really, really significant because it's everyday people talking with other everyday people at a level where they get to know each other and then perhaps can actually have a greater impact on global affairs. So <laughs> this is all possible because we live in a world now that others have alluded to is very different than the world was even five years ago, never mind 10 or 50 years ago. Um, this is a map of Facebook relationships. Right now there's over 800 million Facebook accounts in the world in over 200 countries and 70 languages. There's almost 6 billion mobile phone subscriptions on the planet, 3 billion email addresses registered. So we're connecting like never before, and then we're actually going abroad. So this is from last year over uh, almost 300,000 American students going abroad to study in other countries, more than 700,000 foreign students studying here. And not just studying, but volunteering abroad. You get 13.7 million Google hits if you just search for volunteer abroad. So it's great, it's happening. We're everyday ambassadors, you and me, and this is a great phenomenon. But what I want to chat about today is a warning that if we're not careful, the technology that has brought us people who are very far apart, farther to get, closer together, might be the same force that ends up bringing people who are very close together a lot farther apart. So what I've seen in my own life and, and work and with friends is that sometimes when we use technology too much or let it use us, we become judgmental, distracted, impatient, superficial, impulsive. So I'll give a few quick examples of that. <coughs> when you 
Search on Google. Now the internet is that enormous array of information of every perspective you could ever want, and yet a Google algorithm regularly feeds you back information based on what you've already searched for, more likely. Google ads feed you information on what you're already talking about in your conversations. And when I search Indonesia, a country I frequent, uh, in Google Images, I get pictures of me and my friends first, and then I get other things. So when we're constantly being fed more information about what we've already been searching for, we might be less likely to be able to confront that kind of difference in real life when we're inevitably faced with it. So whether we're talking about Skype, Twitter, Facebook, Google, chatting, um, you always have the option of signing out and logging off, or having multiple windows open at once, which I very often have all of these windows open at once on my computer. Um, moving from conversation to conversation, thinking we're being super efficient and productive, but in reality, we're not only being not very productive, but when it comes to being able to then form those real relationships with people offline, we've developed a really bad habit of not focusing and not being able to cultivate that uh, relationship between another person because we're so busy moving around. Impatience. So <coughs> when it comes to issues like uh, starvation, war, poverty, uh, these issues are huge and they require really detailed analyses to figure out and solutions are going to be very different based on where you are in the world, what the circumstances of the community are. So when we're used to the sound by culture, 140 characters, we diagnose the problem and we're completely missing the point. Capitalism does not cause starvation. Ruling elites don't cause war. And the World Bank doesn't cause poverty. In fact, there's plenty of ruling elites like Bill Gates that does phenomenal things for global health and, and thus peace in the world. Um, I work on a World Bank project that's really creative and really innovative with local community. When we look at things in this soundbite way, which we're very conditioned to hear about, just get the headlines and get the sensational part of it, we're kind of missing out on the details of what it actually takes to solve the problem. So in real life, we might be less equipped to actually solve those problems if we're used to interacting with this. Uh, superficiality. So we have to recognize that we're part of the first generation that regularly can broadcast our statuses to the world, whether it's just to our friend group or in public, whether it's via Facebook or Twitter or other tools. Um, when we're concerned about what we're saying out to the world, we're probably thinking a lot less about how we actually feel inside. So, in a somewhat extreme example, um, I had a friend unfortunately pass away a couple of weeks ago in South Africa, and this is her Facebook wall, where people are now posting their grief on her wall, which to me seems, if it's part of their grieving process, fine, but it also seems that if this is the way where we're dealing with very complicated and complex emotions, then we're perhaps not paying enough attention to our own internal feelings, not based on what other people think of us, but what we think of ourselves, and thus really unable to interact with and help other people as well. And last but not least, uh, the one we all know very well, YouTube comments. So <laughs> we become very impulsive sometimes when we're interacting in a space of anonymous commentary, or not even anonymous, but we know we're probably never going to face that person in real life. Um, now, this, these are all comments from the preview of a TV show called Muslim in America. It's a new TV show. So I guess I was expecting to see some kind of Islamophobic comments, which you can see at the top. But another one about Middle Easterners that doesn't even really make sense. Um, but then someone who I assume is Muslim because they call a beautiful religion, but then call everyone else, well, you can read it, but call people <laughs> very bad names. Um, or under here, which doesn't even really make sense, um, I hate people like you, you should respect everyone's religion, I respect yours. <laughs> <laughs> Things that don't really make sense and certainly aren't how we're actually going to interact with people in real life. So if we're used to, even if we're not perpetuating this kind of commentary, if this is what we're always surrounded by and seeing and we know it can exist, we just have to be careful that it isn't conditioning us to be more impulsive. So, you know, all of these things might add up to be that ugly American, the person who goes abroad and is, you know, impatient and distracted and you're like, I'm not one of them, they're just the people who don't understand. But I'm going to challenge you to think that even people like all of you and like me with the best intentions and the best desire to do great public service are also really susceptible to this. And the reason why I'm kind of picking on the good guys here is because I expect all of you to be in the global leadership realm now and into the future. So I want to make sure that we're at our best and we're actually doing this and using the technological tools we have in our hands in the right way. So I'll use my own story really briefly. <coughs> when I came out of college, um, I moved directly to Indonesia to do a fellowship program. I was working at a drug rehab center um, and was, you know, ready to be, I was very efficient and a workaholic and ready to reform some systems and change the way they did things to make them a more effective organization. 
Um, and those were all great ideas and really good intentions, but I got there and everyone told me, you know, the way you talk about work and productivity, that's the way I think about drugs. So <laughs> people thought that I had some kind of an addiction to work or addiction to efficiency or technology or making things so easy and predictable when in reality, life is not that way at all. And heroin addicts and people recovering from that can tell you that most honestly of all. So I went through my own kind of rehab by working at that center. Um, I stepped back, I, I didn't do all the things that I had set out to do, I did what they asked me to do, which was working the doors at a heavy metal concert, that was a fundraiser, uh, going to see soccer games in another province, hanging out with residents at rehab, cooking and eating with other people, letting someone try to dreadlock my hair, uh, going to weddings, so things that were so relevant to what I had actually come to do, however, ended up being the actual foundation and basis for all the work I did do, because by forming relationships with the people who worked there or were serviced there, who were recovering addicts and living with HIV, who were directly affected by the problems I was so passionate about solving, that was really the first step I needed to take. But I let technology condition me so much to not be very good at that that I had to take a step back and reassess, reevaluate, get off my computer, get offline, and really kind of learn to cultivate those relationships again. So um, technology's not going anywhere, and I'm certainly not running away from it. My work now with the World Bank and elsewhere is in mobile health, figuring out how to, uh, sorry, how to um, design data collection tools and patient management tools on phones so that health workers in Indonesia and Ethiopia can use these to improve care. So technology is great. There's so many wonderful ways we can use it, and we need to keep using that uh, to improve the world. But the message I want to leave you with is one that was posted up in the rehab center because Indonesians like Facebook just as much, if not more, than Americans. <laughs> Um, this message says, technology was meant to bring people who are far away from each other much closer together, not to create a new distance between people who are already close. And so the next time that you're in the airport going on a trip abroad or traveling, I want you to open up your passport, and on mine it's pages 18 and 19 on yours, I'm not sure which one, but you're going to find a quote by Dwight Eisenhower that says, whatever America hopes to bring to pass in the world must first come to pass in the heart of America first. And I want to encourage you all, whatever great social change and innovation that you want to see happen in the world, please make sure to reflect that it's happening <coughs> in your own heart and your own life first. Thank you.